So thanks for coming a little bit early to give me time to catch up to where I want to be. Yesterday we said all sorts of things about AI and concluded by um, explaining to you how to make a computer play chess, which I'm guessing is something a lot of you actually didn't know, so hopefully that's like a cool thing that you've learned, um, maybe. Uh, and I uh, finished with the story of how Deep Blue eventually, in 1997, beat Kasparov, which, uh, you know, was a, I mean, at the time that was an important thing. And the year is sort of interesting, because of this whole thing about predictions about what computers could do in the year 2000. Well, the, you couldn't have full intelligent conversations with them, as we know, you still can't, but they could beat us at chess. Which leads me to this. This is the scene from 2001, where Hal is shown playing chess. So again, you have to understand, when this came out in 68, computers could play chess, but were not, you know, sort of top class at it. So the extrapolation that one would be really good was interesting. People would watch this and think, my God, the computer can, can play chess, you know. So not only could Hal beat you at chess, it knew when it had beat you at chess and would tell you in advance, like three moves ahead, what it was going to do, knowing that you'd be patronised if it didn't. So like, the guy who was playing was a smart guy. So it's like, you know, you can tell, look, you should resign now because I've got you. Hal was very clever. So the ideas that we explored in sort of tic-tac-toe and chess, how to play these competitive games, that these sort of strategies can be applied to other domains. And this has, has been done. And here's one of the other domains that has been applied to. They weren't kidding about this. Uh, it's not made up. I mean, War Games is made up, okay? It's, it's a somewhat fictional tale, but it's, it's very well informed, written by clever people who did the research. 
and indeed, you, do any of you know what the Rand Corporation is? No? Okay. So it's this uh, think tank in America, very closely related to the Pentagon and the defence system, and their job in the, especially the 60s and 70s, was to do this. It was to uh, use all their clever mathematicians and game theorists to figure out what were the uh, strategically sensible way to conduct wars, and actually calculate all this stuff and mathematise it and put it into computers to simulate it. I'm not kidding. Uh, in fact, would you like to read one of their papers? Let's do that, shall we? So here we have the Rand Corporation and one of the things they publish. So if you've seen war games, you'll love this. This is what they're talking about, right? This is the stuff that Professor Falcon was presumably working on in the, in the 60s before he ran away. So here we have a games of strategy, theory and applications. Let's look at the table of contents. Games, strategies, saddle points, uh -huh, optimal strategies, games, methods of solving games, games with states, infinite games, games. Oh, what's this? Tactical air war game. Well, that sounds interesting. Want to open up the PDF and have a look at that? Yes, why don't we? Tactical air war game. The problem of optimal employment of tactical air forces in the various theater air tasks, like many other military questions, can be analyzed as a multi-move game between two sides. Okay, goes on. Equations. Right? This is, this is what they were doing. Figuring it all out. And of course they would put these in computers when the computers came along. Come up with their payoff matrices to kind of figure out what's the most effective way to, you know, slaughter people. There's a nice little table showing you how you do it. So that's all lovely. Um, if you go to the top here, you'll see there's a nice little bit at the top. The Rand Corporation is a non-profit research organisation. You can support them if you'd like, if you want to give them some of your money to help them plan how to annihilate the species most effectively. You can, uh, you can do that if you wish. So that's nice. Let's talk about learning. He was into games, as well as computers. He designed them so that they could play checkers or grip, chess. Well, so worry about that. Everybody's doing that now. Oh, no, no, no. What he did was great. He, he designed his computer so they could learn from his own mistakes. So they'd be better the next time they played. The system actually learned how to learn. But it could teach itself. If I could just get that damn password, I could play the computer. Okay, you've seen that bit. We're in. Oh, by the way, when I was looking at the RAND website, I did try to find their paper on global thermonuclear war. Couldn't find that one, though. I think that might still be classified. So, what is learning? Because that would be cool, right? A lot of the AI things we've talked about up till now, you can make them do certain things, but they don't actually learn. You know, the, the thing that plays chess, it plays chess, it knows the rules, it can see ahead, it plays the game, but it doesn't learn. So learning is an interesting concept and not easy to define, but I've sort of invented a definition just to give us something to work with. So I'm going to say that learning has to do with the ability to react differently to repeated situations or stimulus as a consequence of prior experience, analysis, or thought. So the, the big idea being, it's the same situation, or sort of the same situation as before, but you're going to do something different. And that, to me, would be what learning would imply. One of the things it implies. This can be compared with a popular definition of insanity that you may have heard. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So learning is the opposite thing from insanity, I think. Uh, that quote, of course, you might know is generally attributed to Albert Einstein, incorrectly. Like most quotes, it's not. He didn't say it. Uh, so how, how do we do the learning thing, though? Wouldn't that be great? Well, um, I've kind of given a definition of learning that implies some things. Uh, in order for it to work, you'd need to have some kind of long-term, persistent, mutable state in order to deal with this idea that you might be put in the same situation, but you'd do something different. So you need to be able to change your state, uh, which is memory and the ability to change so it's you know, uh, writable memory. Um, so for example, you could make a chess program that learned if it were somehow able to respond to its previous results, you know, its victories and defeats, and change its strategy. The idea would be that 
you know, if it lost, it would take that as like a negative feedback signal. It would say, well, I lost. That probably means that my estimation of how I evaluate the board and so on can't be, can't be perfect. Therefore, I should change it a bit. So that's the sort of uh, thing you would, you would try to do. Um, Turing actually suggested this way back in the day. Uh, he thought, yeah, what you would do is you could change the evaluation function that's used to work out the, you know, the, the, the value of a particular board scenario that you would, when you programmed it, you would give it what you thought were the relative values of queens and rooks and bishops. But the idea is that as it played and responded to its successes and failures, it would tweak those values up and down a little bit and try to get better and it would end up coming up with its own idea as to what the relative weights of the pieces should be. So uh, it's kind of a reward and punishment system. And again, in the, the 1950 paper, he talks about this. And he says that if you wanted to generalize learning, like if you wanted to create a real AI, one of his ideas, quite eccentric, but you know, plausible, is you would sort of raise the AI like it was a child. Uh, you, know, you would teach it the same sort of way. Um, but you would also have feedback to encourage it to do things that you thought were good and uh, negative signals to dissuade it from doing things that you thought were bad. Um, so basically when it did the wrong thing you would hit it. <laughs> it was sort of AI through corporal punishment. Um, but this is a tricky thing because if you get a feedback signal like you play a game and you win or you lose that tells you something but you don't know what it tells you. You know, if you lose, you don't know, well, what was the bad move that I made? It wasn't, it wasn't just the last move that you made that was the bad one. The bad move might have been 10 moves ago. So how, how do you know? And that's kind of tricky, but there are things you could do. What you could do is you could speculate as to which was the bad move and then replay the game over in your head, changing the moves at various points until you find at which place was there something you could have done differently that might have led to a better outcome and maybe train yourself that way. I kind of already covered that. Um, so I mean, it's, it's hard to do it, but in theory, I think you could do it. Uh, you could take a program, maybe a limited domain program, not one that could do anything, but something that, you know, like a chess player. Uh, you could make it do some kind of learning like this over time by simply making it try and do experiments in its head and reinforce its, uh, its ideas. And in fact, it's been done uh, in various ways. Does anyone know what genetic algorithms are? Nope, okay. Uh, so genetic algorithms are this cool idea, but it's still a bit fringe, I think. But the idea is if you've got a problem, you're trying to make a computer solve, and you don't know how to do it, which is kind of where we are now with the hard problems, the things that, like, we don't know how to do them. How can you write a program to do them? Well, one idea is you kind of imitate what the world appears to do with evolution, and uh, you, you basically come up with a whole bunch of random programs. Uh, not quite as simple as that. Obviously, a purely random program is very unlikely to do anything. So you come up with like a template for a program, but there are bits where you don't know how far should I look ahead? Should I do this? Should I do that? How much should I multiply these magic numbers by? These things you don't know. So you put all those in like a kind of data string that is basically the chromosome of your program. And you just create like a hundred random variations of that chromosome and you try them. You try them against some real data and you rank them based on how well they do. So for example, you might create like a, a simulated ant colony or something and the ants have got different random behaviors about you know, how attracted they are to certain scents and uh, you know, how far away they'll, they'll go from their home before they decide they want to come back. And you just, you just put all these things in and try them and you take the ones that survive and breed those ones with each other, which is to say you take their chromosomes and you kind of slice and dice them, just like nature does, to create something that, you know, sometimes will get the good things of both of the parents. And then you add some randomness to create the possibility of progress. So that's it. You just simulate evolution. And you run these things for a long time, and eventually something good sometimes pops out. I've seen this being done to do things like locomotion systems, you know, to create like virtual animals that learn how to run and walk and stuff, which is quite a hard thing to do. Um, you can do it by taking all the parameters about how you might time the motion of your muscles, we don't quite know, and just evolve them through a genetic algorithm. And it's, you can go and see, I haven't got the videos for it here, but you can see videos of people doing stuff like this, and you see creatures that like, fall apart and are crazy because they don't know how to walk, and they just flail around and they're complete uh, clowns. Um, but over time, some of them sort of learn how to stand upright, 
and then some of them learn how to you know move forward and how to run and how to retain their balance while they're running and eventually you end up kind of doing something that you didn't really know how to do so that's genetic algorithms the other cool thing which is kind of the new hotness is uh, artificial neural networks how many of you know about them yeah see I, I think people are starting to know about them it's really interesting I, I was into them before they were cool okay uh, I learned about neural networks when I was a student and they were they actually had a slight spike in popularity around the early 90s but it's kind of complicated they get popular for a while and then it looked as if ah, no they're not really any good we can't we can do some things with them but we can't do anything interesting and they fell out of favor but I actually there are various things I've wanted to do in my life one of them was to work on this but um, the world was very different back then I didn't know how to do it I did you know I couldn't go on Google and find out who's the best researcher in the world in neural nets and send them an email and say can I come and work with you so I didn't I wasn't able to do that uh, so I ended up making computer games never mind um, but neural networks I've had an interest in them for ages uh, they, when I first wrote this course I put this material in and it was pretty obscure this was like still a bit fringe it was it was in like was it 2013 the first time I did that it had really only been about 2012 that neural nets started to get cool again um, and now uh, it's like they're all over the place they're they're totally the thing uh, however um, I need to think a little bit about the time okay I'll, I'll go for a little bit further and then I'll take the break uh, so uh, the neural network ideas if you take the genetic algorithm idea that's another attempt to sort of let's copy something from nature let's copy evolution to help us solve problems that we don't know how to solve neural networks are like that in another way and they say let's just copy neuroscience let's just simulate brains now I must tell you don't take that too literally or too seriously um, the problem now is that neural nets have become so hyped that some people are kind of get carried away with the idea that once again they are electronic brains just like computers themselves in the 1950s were described as electronic brains and everyone got very scared and confused um, the mo modern neural nets are not a close correspondence to real biology but they're inspired by it it's kind of like the metaphor of a brain and neurons not actually accurate neuroscience at the moment but the idea is simulate brains I mean how you, that's a way to get intelligence isn't it I mean I always felt that's obviously the way to do it um, so as I said you know networks were kind of a little bit cool when I was uh, sort of your age but it, it turned out to be difficult to scale them and make them do bigger harder things so they, 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 they kind of fell out of fashion for a period um, but guess what they are interesting so the way it works is you have some very simple processing units that you call neurons inspired by the neurons that brains have got in them and you just connect the neurons together with a, a weighted graph that is sort of simulating the way in which the uh, you know the kind of axons and dendrites in a, in a brain are connecting the neurons together so here's the, the kind of simple arrangement that's sometimes used you have a set of input neurons and you might do something like connect these to an eye so this is like visual data would come into these things and stimulate them so basically just put a number into these boxes and then there are some wires here and the idea is that if you take the, the hidden layer here this is the, the kind of neurons that are inside the brain they become like a weighted average of the various inputs somehow using weights that it develops over time and you take this and you do a couple of layers of this and eventually produce an output and the idea might here be here that if the net was working properly it would take the little kind of visual information that was coming in here and it would pop out here with an output that maybe said it's a dog or when it said it's a cat that kind of thing and that's how you would you would hopefully get a system that could recognize stuff that one that one is too simple that one would not be capable of doing such a thing okay um, so real ones uh, especially when you hear about them nowadays they talk about deep learning so they're talking about neural nets that have got many layers so it's you know uh, maybe dozens of layers of uh, these kind of neural things um, so yeah it's, it's a rough a rough analogy to the brain and uh, the idea is that you take a weighted combination of your inputs and you map that onto a kind of output function usually it has to be like a non-linear function um, 
something uh, you if you really care about these things you can read up on them they sometimes use sigmoid curves to to do the weightings for interesting technical reasons uh, so when you've got one of these neural nets, the question becomes how do you train it to make it actually learn things? Well, because the whole point of a neural net, a bit like a genetic algorithm, that you kind of drive it externally in the hope that it will get better at what you wanted it to do. Um, same sort of thing with the neural net. So what you might have is you might have a whole set of pictures and you want your neural net to be able to classify them and tell you which ones are the good pictures that have got doggies in them and which ones are the boring rubbish pictures that have got cats in them. Right? So how would you do this? Well, what you do is you just submit lots and lots of pictures to an initially, let's say, randomly configured network where the weightings that it uses are just like random numbers. Uh, if you do that, it will be rubbish, of course. It will just produce kind of random outputs. But the idea is with training, you tell it when it's got it wrong and when it's got it right and say, uh, you know, no, sorry, that was a dog and you said it was a cat. You're an idiot. Please fix yourself. And the idea is it would say, ah, well, okay, I'll go and change some of my weights in my head uh, and I'll do that to make me a bit more likely to have said that was a dog. And you just keep doing this to it over and over and eventually, you know, it's, it's not trivial because you have to do it in a way that doesn't uh, erase previous knowledge, but eventually you just tell it, keep changing your weights until you get better and it improves over time. And the hope would be that if you do this on the training set, you get it to the point where you could then give it a picture it had not seen before and say to it, is it a cat or is it a dog? And it would maybe tell you. Part of the secret for doing this is an algorithm called backpropagation and that's how it works out which weights to modify and how. It's kind of quite subtle, it's kind of it's cal calculus basically. It's a uh, a kind of uh, backwards version of the chain rule from calculus. Uh, so that's the magic. And the backpropagation algorithm was invented quite a long time ago. Um, I don't know the full history of this. It's like there was definitely work being done on it in the 80s, some maybe even earlier. And uh, so, you know, the, the work's been around for a while. Part of the reason it's all become interesting recently is just because computer power has caught up so much that you can it's become more practical to actually do it, even though the theory, or at least a lot of the theory, had been around for a while. Um, so yeah, you basically look at the delta of the actual output compared to the desired output, and you use that as a feedback signal to tell the system to correct itself. So it's a huge subject, right? Neural nets are a big deal. Uh, you could, uh, you could spend a long time learning about them. And of course, I'm not an expert on them. I'm an interested amateur. I, I, I try to follow the field, but you know, I don't have a PhD in neural nets or anything else. Um, so it's a huge, huge area. If you want to learn about it, though, you can do what I did, and you can take an online course in neural networks by this guy, Jeffrey Hinton, who is one of the pioneers in the field. He was involved in the backpropagation algorithms and a lot of the great work that was done. Uh, funny fact about Jeff Hinton, he is the great-great-grandson of George Bull, the guy that invented Booleans, all that stuff. I'm telling you, runs in families. Genetics. Uh, and, and Jeff Hinton's really good. I, I actually, apart from wanting to learn the subject, um, he's, a, he's a very good lecturer, I find. Very clear, very well organised, quite kind of dry uh, in a good way, like a dry sense of humour. Um, I, I watched a lot of his stuff when I was trying to teach myself how to be a lecturer when I suddenly had to learn how to be one. Uh, so I, I like Jeff. And this is quite a good video if you want to look, if you want to just see one thing about neural nets by an expert, that would be a good one. And uh, guess what? He now works for Google because uh, Google, Facebook, Apple, they've all suddenly started buying up all the smart neural net guys. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's great stuff. Uh, the, the, so the neural nets have been, um, especially in recent years, extended to lots of new problems, problems that we used to solve in other ways, but increasingly it turns out that neural nets are producing better results. Uh, among the things that you can do uh, with a, a neural net, you can use them to recognize speech. And when I say recognize speech, what I say, what I mean is what I say, uh, which is recognize speech, because that is what I said. How many of you heard me saying recognize speech? Some of you caught it, right? How many of you thought I was saying recognize speech? 
yeah, everybody else, right? So speech recognition is a hard problem. It's really ambiguous. You can't just analyze the sounds and work it out from there because as you saw, that can go wrong. Uh, so recognized speech is actually a, a sort of famous example of a phrase that's uh, ambiguous for speech recognition in English. And, uh, and it reveals the fact that to really recognize speech, no, to really recognize speech, you actually have a lot of expectations in your head about what you think the person is likely to say. So you're not just analyzing sound. It needs to have a lot of knowledge about the world and expectations about grammar and which words are more likely to occur and what's the subject the person is talking about. All that hard stuff, that's one of the reasons it's so damn hard. And it used to be hard. Again, for most of my life, this was an unsolved hard problem, speech recognition. But, I mean, it's, you know, we've got it in our phones now and it nearly works <laughs> some of the time, uh, which is, again, that's just a huge leap. Another, it's another thing that speech recognition was one of these things that when I was learning was seen as a hard AI problem because we sort of realized how difficult it was. Um, but now that we can do it, it's not even AI anymore. It's like, it's an app you have on your phone, nobody cares. But do you not realize it's amazing that computers can understand what you're saying to them? It really is. Okay. Um, other things, uh, they can analyze images, you maybe know that. This was in fact one of the first interesting things I saw, if, it, if this is the right link, in 2012 Google came out with a thing that, uh, that was um, an image recognizer. They wanted to take all the unlabeled images that they have and know what was in them so it was easier to search them. Because you know, how are you going to search all these images unless you know what's in the images? So they, they wanted their dog cat recognizer and uh, they worked on it. Uh, and interesting, one of the people who worked on it was Jeff Dean who uh, is um, a famously cool, clever Google programmer. He's a bit of a hero in the computing world. I'll maybe send you around the list of uh, Jeff Dean jokes later. But basically, Jeff Dean is he's like the, um, i trying to remember the name, the, the silly American fighting guy. Norris. Chuck Norris, yeah. So Ch Jeff Dean is like the Chuck Norris of programmers. You know, he can, he can do anything. Um, so he worked on this thing. And here you go, a scientific paper and neural nets and stuff. And, uh, and they put in all these images of faces and eventually got the neural net to sort of learn what a face was as a concept, which they could then use to recognize faces and do things with them. So this is all the stuff that's going on. It's amazing. Um, they can also recognize handwriting. It's one of the earliest things they did. In fact, this was done in late I think maybe the late 80s or something, a guy called Jan Lecan, who um, as of recently works for Facebook as the head of their AI division. Uh, he's an interesting, he's actually worth following on Facebook because he, he posts fairly regularly about all the cool, interesting research they're doing and he's like a proper research scientist. So he's quite honest about things. What he's really good at is taking the latest media story about some uh, neural net development and he unpicks it and tells you where all the lies are and you know tells you what actually happened. He's really he's a useful guy and he worked on an early handwriting recognition system that has been used since the early 90s by uh, the US Postal Service to do stuff like uh, you know recognizing handwritten zip codes or processing checks I believe. So we've actually had neural net based uh, handwriting systems for ages, but for a long time it kind of looked like that was the only thing they were any good at uh, until recently. Um, yeah. So the recent developments are, are very cool. Um, one of the things that's caused them to take off is the, the advent of the GPU, you know, the graphics processing unit that you've got in your machine, supposed to be to help you do 3D graphics really fast, but it turns out what they really do is they do kind of big long matrix math things really fast and guess what that's just what neural nets need so all these researchers who had all their stuff started realizing that if they rewrote their program to run it on a GPU it would get like you know a hundred times faster and that made them a lot better also big companies like Google and Facebook um, have got huge amounts of data which in the past researchers didn't have like a researcher would try to train a system on a picture library and he'd maybe have a million pictures, it would be a big database, and the Google people just laugh and say, take a billion, see what you can do with that, and guess what, the results are better. So you can do all sorts of clever things with neural nets now. Uh, one of the recent ones was automatic caption writing for images, have you seen this thing? Oh, it's scary as hell. Um, 
So again, Google are doing this. Um, so here's a picture that they've just given to the system. It said, what's that? And it says, that is two pizzas sitting on top of a stove top oven. Seriously, I mean, what the hell? Uh, and, and you know, this is an image that the system hadn't seen before. What they do is they, they throw a ton of images at it um, and they allow it to kind of identify what it thinks are objects and the images. And then for some of the images, they give it a set of, uh, you know, human written captions telling it what various things are. So eventually, once it sees enough pictures of bikes, and it has the word bike associated with them all, it starts to realise, well, that thing with the, with the wheels and the stuff, that's a bike, okay, understand. Next time it sees a bike, it says, it's a bike. Um, so, this is kind of how they do it. And here are some of their examples. Uh, it's a little bit small here. Let me magnify if this computer can handle it. A person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road. Uh, but they're not perfect. Uh, there's one. A dog is jumping to catch a frisbee. Not quite, but it did get the dog though, and that's the important thing. Um, a refrigerator filled with lots of food and drinks. Not quite. Again, if you look at the popular stories, you tend to not see this side of it. So always look for what they're not good at doing yet. But uh, but I mean, it's not bad though. Two hockey players fighting over a puck. Close up of a cat laying on a couch. Yeah. Don't know why he thinks that's a red motorcycle. Yellow school bus? No, not quite. But I mean, come on, this is getting interesting. But uh, don't get too carried away, though. They're, they aren't about to take over the world. They don't really understand the world. They are just pattern recognition systems, right? A neural net is basically just a big, giant, dirty function that takes a bazillion inputs and produces some outputs. And it's just a function. I mean, like, you see how they work. It's just a whole bunch of numbers being multiplied together. It is just a function that's trained on data to make it recognise the patterns that we think are significant or that actually, possibly patterns that actually are objectively significant. Uh, so yeah, oh. but this, this is great though because the idea is they can now run this over their picture library to make pictures meaningfully searchable and they're starting to run it over videos so they can do things like describe what's in a YouTube video so you can search YouTube not by magic words that need to be in the subject but search it for the things that are in the video. Yeah. So that's one of the things they can do. Uh, the other great thing they can do is they can hallucinate dogs, which I think is the best thing. Have you seen that yet? Yeah. So the some of the, the visual recognition systems, obviously they, they take a picture input and they try and categorize the stuff. But actually it's quite hard to work out what a neural net is really doing because they're so big. Uh, you know, the, the number of nodes in them is enormous. They're just this big list of magic numbers. Uh, it's hard to like, wrap your head around it. So one of the things the researchers do to help them figure out what the net is doing is they can ask it to hallucinate. So they give it images and they say, what do you think that's like? And then they say, okay, draw a picture of a thing that is like that thing you're thinking of. And then they say, what does that look like? And they do it again and again and again. So you basically put it on an acid trip. Um, and for some reason, one of the data sets that they use, I don't know whether it's an accident that there's like an artificial bias, or if it is actually just a true fact of the universe that dogs are an intrinsically important idea, which I think is true. Uh, but a lot of these systems seem to be very obsessed with dogs. So here is a video that was taken of a guy walking through the supermarket and he put it into the neural net and told it to hallucinate and exaggerate what it thought it saw. And this is how they see the world. Internet permitting.
okay, I think that's enough, you get the idea. But I mean, we've all experienced that, right? You walk into a room and you just imagine that all the people have got dogs' heads on them, don't you? Yeah? But I'm doing it right now. Oh, look, oh, look at them, look at their wee faces. It's almost as if they understand. Yeah. Maybe that's just me, I don't know. Uh, so it turns out these uh, neural net chaps, they can actually also play games in a desperate attempt to uh, bring some fake relevance to this. Uh, and the, the game playing is not just a hack. I mean, there are obviously hacky ways to you know, play a game. Some of you did it yourself, some of you did versions of Pong where you had AI, that was cool. But obviously that was like a hard-coded piece of AI that could only play Pong. Uh, this thing, done by a company called DeepMind last year or the year before, um, tries to play games like honestly. So the input to this neural net is just pixels and its output is uh, keys that it's allowed to press on a joypad. And that's it, you just throw a bunch of pixels at it over time and train it. The feedback is the score, it's given special access to the score so it knows whether it's winning or losing. And you just keep throwing all this stuff at it and you tell it, maximise your score. And then over time it learns how to play games. So here it is playing Breakout. There you go. But I don't believe the hype. How, how, how many of you heard this story before about the game playing thing? You not heard about it? Some of you? Right. So, I mean, it's very impressive, right? But you always got to be a bit careful, okay? So, it turns out there are some games it's not any good at. They tried it on Space Invaders and it was rubbish at that and a couple of other ones. It depends on the nature of the game. There are certain types of behaviour that require a bit too much memory, a bit too much kind of complex state management that are beyond what current neural net technology can capture. So they can't do everything. Uh, turns out they're, they're really good at breakout, but breakout isn't everything, right? Uh, so how do I know about these secret limitations? Because it's not, if, again, if you read the press, you'd think that, you know, it was Skynet, right? Um, how do I know? I read the goddamn paper. If you go and look at the goddamn paper, Again, scientific papers are usually pretty honest, even by you know companies that have got like a commercial vested interest. Uh, I think the process of science keeps them a little bit honest. You know, peer review they can't get away with complete uh, fabrication. So if you go and look at the end of the paper, they've got this, which is their, their data, and you can go and see breakout. Uh, there's their their deep thing thingy net thing. Uh, scores 160, a human 31. Oh, that's good. You're better than a human. Wonderful. Um, Enduro, yeah, you're doing okay. Pong, yeah, you're doing okay, fine. Cuber, oh, you're rubbish, right? Humans are getting, it's like a tenth of the score of a human. Uh, Sequest, rubbish. Space Invaders, not very good either, okay? So they can't do everything. But still, pretty cool though. Um, Didn't they say, I read an interview with them that they said a couple of years uh, they're going to train AI to play Pong and they're going to train it to play Warcraft and Starcraft and then about 10 years they, uh, they 
Uh -huh. um, I've maybe heard some of those claims, but not all. Was that maybe Demis Hassabus talking in interviews? Um, you know, interviews with journalists. It's like, wah, 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 wah. Uh, but I mean, these are the aspirations, of course. They do think that they've really hit something now and that they can make these things better as they refine the techniques. So this is exactly the curve we might be on. But just don't assume that it's like inevitably going to happen. But it's, it's definitely going to be fun to watch as, uh, as they try and make these systems better. A little personal anecdote. Um, I came to Iceland, what was it, five years ago now, after my previous company in Scotland blew up. And one of my friends who worked with me there quite closely, I came here to Iceland, obviously. He went down to London to work for a little startup company called DeepMind. Uh, last year, they were sold to Google for $400 million. Obviously, I wish him very well. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, good for him. And I'm here doing this. Uh, so, but this is okay. Education is important. Um, so neural nets are great, and I can't, but I can't give you a whole course on them. But they're super cool. Pay attention to them; they're they're interesting. Uh, but for the rest of this talk, I'll have to go back to more traditional stuff, stuff that you could do, stuff that's a bit like what happens in actual games of the moment. So let's do root finding because that's one of the classic AI problems. Any of you know how to do root finding already? No, nope. good. You're all going to learn something then. Great. Right, getting from A to B, root finding. Well, getting from A to B is actually very easy. Uh, the hard thing is getting from A to Z via B, C, D, E, and F. That's the hard problem. Um, that's sort of a joke. Okay. So there's a naive root finding algorithm, the one you would use if you, you know, your first approximation, which would be point towards Z, go that way. Hope you don't bump anything. This is what I use to get home when I'm lost, because uh, I live near Halkebskirk here. So I just, right, I'm going that way. And, uh, you know, you have to like avoid traffic and stuff, but it nearly works. So, uh, uh, But the naive route finding does fail sometimes. If you ever see me in somebody's garden, you know, walking on the spot against, against somebody's wall, that's what's happened. Um, but there are ways to get around this, some of which you've maybe seen in games. One is you kind of go straight towards the destination, but when you hit a wall, you just decide to look consistently either look hug to the left or hug to the right, and you just walk around the obstacle until you're free from it, and then you go back to where you're going. And that sort of works up to a point. You can invent cases where it doesn't work, but it you know, nearly works. Um, so in fact, route planning is a bit like playing a game of chess with just yourself and the world where you plan a little bit ahead, you think so many moves ahead as to where you're going to go and try to evaluate which of those positions would be good for you, which one is closer to home and you, you, know, you go down the one that you think is best. Um, if you do that, you'll get a root tree because remember with, with tic-tac-toe and chess I was showing you what a game tree looks like? Well, a root tree would be kind of a version of that where for each point on your journey you look at Let's say you could go, you know, each of the the kind of compass directions, and you decide whether to go that way and work out whether that's better or worse than where you are. Um, but there'll be a problem with that that the branching factor there is very high because there's lots of ways you can go at any time, and the place you're trying to get to is often many steps away. So this tree would be like really wide and really deep, and it would use too much memory, and you couldn't store it, and you couldn't think about it. So uh, that's not actually the practical way of doing it. Also, there are multiple paths to get to a place, and the paths intersect and cross each other. So it's more like a graph than a tree. And it all just gets kind of hard. But one way to, uh, to kind of deal with these problems and avoid wasting your time thinking about redundant paths that are just going in circles that aren't really helping you is to try and grow the solution. You have like a contour of the places you could get to in two steps and then say okay now what's the contour of places I could get to in three steps and you just you know just map it out and out and out um, and that is, there's an algorithm for this it basically does sort of that it's called Dijkstra's algorithm named after the computer scientist Edgar Dijkstra and this is how it works so that's the the planner beginning and he's working out and he's expanding this contour of places that he can go and he keeps expanding kind of uniformly when he hits obstacles, it's obvious that, well, I can't keep going that way, so these kind of get blocked off, but he keeps exploring the other options, and eventually those options get past the obstacle, and once they're free of the obstacle, 
they still don't know what they're doing, but eventually, because they try every direction, they're going to start trying to come over to this target point. So you see, it takes a while, but it does get there, and when it gets there, it can then work backwards from having found it to find the shortest path to get there, which is this thing. So it takes a, it thinks about it all, and then it takes a clean path instead of just like walking into the wall stupidly and then rooting around it. It basically thinks ahead, realizes that it would bump into it and root around it, knows where to go, and then says, "Ah, okay," and then it comes up with this sort of, you know, the kind of shortest, cleanest path to get to the destination. You understand that, yeah? I think it's. I think the diagram helps a lot to illustrate it. Let's just uh, give it one more chance to complete, so you can internalize the the, uh, the behavior yourself. And with every step, you see it records where it came from. That's how it knows how to reverse the path once it gets to the end, because it, it knows how it got to places. Uh, so it just does that. Bing. So that's Dexter's algorithm. So that was Dexter on a grid. But as you saw, there were a lot of. It had to do a lot of work. It had to inspect a lot of little points on that big kind of array, right? <laughs> more than it needed to, we feel. You look at that and you think, yeah, you got there, but you did a lot of kind of stupid work, didn't you? Um, so it turns out in reality, uh, well, reality, uh, in games, you don't want to explore a whole grid because it's quite slow. What you do instead is you just explore around the, the important landmarks of a map. Uh, and you represent those landmarks on a graph structure and you tell it to navigate across the graph. So that would be like a graph version instead where you say, these are the landmarks, you know, major junctions or something in the world. And you say, okay, I just want you to explore the route through these major junctions. And it's the same things going on here. It's expanding. This is it actually running Dijkstra, calculating how the cost of getting to each of these nodes and working out where to go next. So it's just what, what you did there, but running on a graph rather than a grid. Okay. Um, and that uh, tends to be more economical. You know, you're going to get faster results this way. And games do this a lot. And in games, these, uh, this graph data structure that's used for the root finding is, is called a nav mesh, navigational mesh. So it's like a simplified version of the game world that's designed as a just a simple, you know, point-to-point -point map that the root system, root finding system, can use. Um, incidentally, we use this in Eve. In EVE Online, the graph of which uh, solar systems you can get to every time you jump through a Stargate, that's every graph. And when we're auto-planning the route from one place to another, in fact it was last year one of my friends worked on the, the code for that, which had become a bit old and hideous, like lots of the code, uh, and he wrote it uh, again to make it cleaner, and he implemented Dijkstra's algorithm, and that's how we, that's how we compute the routes in space. Okay. Uh, so the nav meshes, you pre-compute those usually, you can you know, generate them from your geometry data, or you can just get the level designers to make them by hand, uh, and they look like this. So here, there's like, here are like real polygons that are the physical world, and here's a nav mesh, which as you can see in this case is going between the sort of centres of these other polygons, and it's just defining the shape. And this one's slightly different, this one is going to midpoints along the edges, a bit more like doorways, yeah, connecting between doorways sort of thing. Right, uh, so that was Dijkstra, but you can do even better sometimes. There's a thing called A star search, um, which I briefly alluded to in lecture one. It's just a little Easter egg. Um, so even with, uh, if you look at Dijkstra on the grid, you can see that it, it kind of it was doing a lot of stuff that seemed redundant, as I said to you. Um, and it's like you watching it know that it's kind of wasting its time with some of it. And it's like, well, how, how do you know that it's wasting its time? Um, part of it is that it's doing things that are like going the wrong way. You know, it was expanding those that were going backwards from the target because it just expands the whole contour. They're like, really? Are you going to expand the contour the wrong, completely the wrong way? Why don't you preferentially expand the contour that's like somewhere near where we're going? I mean, that won't always work because the somewhere near where you're going might eventually hit a wall, at which point you do have to go the long way. But you know, maybe try going the short way first. So A star basically tries to go the short way first. Uh, so the idea is that you, if you've got this contour to expand, expand the most promising node. Expand the one that looks like the best one. So, but what's the best one? 
Uh, if you already knew what the best one was, the problem would be solved, right? If at any given point you knew what the best way to go was, your algorithm would be keep going the best way. So you don't know what the best way is, so it's a guess, an intelligent guess, which in AI we call a heuristic. Uh, by the way, Hal's name in 2001 is sometimes thought to be uh, heuristic algorithms and logic, because the idea was that an AI system would use these heuristics to figure things out. There's another story that his name is the letters of IBM shifted by one, which it is, but Arthur C. Clarke says that isn't deliberate, but it is true if you take the letters of HAL and you shift them to become IBM, because IBM used to be, you know, uh, a big company that did things. Um, they have been eclipsed since, rightly so. Um, yeah, so anyway, so you come up with a heuristic and you follow the heuristic, but it won't always be right, so you need to have a fallback for when it's wrong, uh, but that's okay. So what this ends up doing is you create a version of Dijkstra that's more aggressive in pursuing what look like the good directions, and the result is like this. Boom! Right? It just tries to go in a straight line, and then when it hits something, it says, ah, right, okay, I need to try going a bit further afield. So it just tries a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Then eventually it gets round the edges and it's like, ah, I'm off again. And fairly quickly, much more quickly than Dijkstra, it gets to the end point and does the same thing, gets to the end and then traces a route back. So it did it without expanding anywhere near as many nodes. Right? So in situations where you can do this, where you've got a heuristic that guides you, and the heuristic is usually just you know, uh, simple distance, like naive as the crow flies distance. Um, that makes you kind of encourages you to go that way. The result is uh, is often better. And again, real games do use this. Real open world games. If you've got, in fact, the uh, World Metal Country used this when the tanks are trying to work out where to get from place to place. They use A Star to do it. Okay. Uh, see a little video of A Star actually being used to help you visualise what it looks like. This is a little uh, map editor that the person's made. So they're they're drawing in the blue stuff as walls that they're drawing in. Uh, I mean, you'll, you'll draw some walls and then you tell the thing to try and get from source to destination, and you'll sort of see how it routes around the obstacles. So you see that the white areas are the nodes that it's exploring as it's trying to kind of fish its way out and then once it gets to where it's going it kind of says ah okay now I know and it plots the red path which is the best path through the, the forest that it's explored. These stars are a good little algorithm, quite fun. So you can expand on this once you've got A star and do sensory search, because the problem is that A star is actually too good, right? Um, in fact, if you look at what it was doing there, the, the problem is, I mean, it almost cheats from a game point of view, because it has access to all the information, including information about things that it can't see, like things that are like hidden by walls and around corners. Uh, are some of you too warm? You can open that window, maybe? If, uh, is that are you, are you too warm? No. Oh, I thought you were. Okay, never mind. Um, so, uh, what was I saying? Yes. Uh, so, A star can be too good because it can see around corners, which is kind of cheating a little bit. So, there's another version of this where you do A star, but you don't let it compute points that are beyond what it could reasonably see or know about from its own memory. Right? To stop the to stop the bad guys being like ruthlessly unfairly efficient at finding you, right? You kind of say it's like, look, if you don't if you don't know that there's a corner there, you're not allowed to 
magically see around corners and stuff. That's cheating. Uh, so you just restrict it by um, a kind of sensory system. I'm sure the stealth games do this. You know that they can only go as far on the map as they have awareness of, or can see, or can hear, whatever. Um, so you can just modify it that way. Another thing you can do is include a cost factor for the terrain types, so that uh, you make it realise that you know depending on the terrain, whether it's like steep or boggy, that you you say that okay that path, the distance might be you know the same as some other path, but it's harder ground to go over, or it's more exposed or something. Uh, you would use that to actually artificially penalise paths that you don't want it to take. So uh, that's a thing you can do. Okay, so there was a bunch of stuff. Uh, so we had the super fancy neural net stuff, which is like the future, and this is me helping you to be ready for it, and some good old tradition stuff, traditional stuff like route finding that you sort of need to know just to kind of get started. Uh, so I can wrap it up a bit now, and let's just talk again about good old Mr. Turing. Um, some people have said that the question, our original question, can machines think, is not a meaningful question. It's like asking, can submarines swim? It's like, well, you know, maybe they can, maybe they can't. I mean, they, you know, they get the job done, they transport themselves through water. Is that swimming? Or is it like, no, it's a way of getting to places through the water, but it's a different, it's not swimming. Well, this maybe depends. This is the idea that computers can do some things that we do by thinking, like, identifying images and you know identifying things in pictures we do that by thinking uh, they do it by this other thing and maybe that's not thinking but if it gets the job done does it count I don't know uh, funny thing about the meaning of the words here I don't know how it translates in Icelandic I'm afraid but you know the, the, the can submarines swim generally we say no you know just by the meaning of words the thing that submarines do is not called swimming correct we don't think of it as swimming um, but what do airplanes do they do fly, don't they? They don't do this, but we say that they fly. Okay? So, you know, interesting stuff. Um, my opinion, and it's speculative, I can't know, but I have tried to think about it. I think that, in principle, a machine could be made to think in our sense of the world. Um, that's kind of because I'm a you know philosophical materialist. I think we're robots. I think we're just stuff that does physics and in principle if you knew how that worked you could make a computer do it so I, I kind of think it could be done um, and I, I even think it will happen don't know how long it will take it might be you know it might be a good damn while um, it's not going to be tomorrow and it's not going to be the next 10 years or anything but uh, I think it could happen that's assuming there are humans left to do it uh, we haven't nuked ourselves which is still a big risk, by the way. Don't think that's not a risk anymore. Those, those damn things are still out there. Um, okay, so this is the thing that Turing said. He said, this is only a foretaste of what is to come and only the shadow of what is going to be. We have to have some experience with the machine before we really know its capabilities. It may take years before we settle down to the new possibilities, but I do not see why it should not enter any of the fields normally covered by the human intellect and eventually compete on equal terms. And he said that in a different thing that he wrote, or a, an address he gave in 1949. So he thought it would happen. And now we have it. So, um, how many of you have seen the film? Okay, uh, maybe like a quarter or something. So you haven't all seen the film. Um, if you've been watching along, you'll get the idea. Though there's an AI system. It's been, you know, it plays games. Turns out one of those games is Nuclear War. It's secretly a government computer. Uh, Unfortunately, the person who was doing it didn't realise that it was real, so he's just told this computer to play the game of nuclear war. Hijinks ensue, and uh, this is what happens. You put the list back up? No, we already tried that. Put it up! Yes, put it up. So these are the various games that this computer knew how to play, that it had obviously been learning from the Rand Corporation memos, things like checkers, chess, poker, games that teach you the basics, and then it gets harder, this kind of thing, hit the ground actions, theater-wide tactical warfare, theater-wide biotoxic and chemical warfare, global thermonuclear war. One of them was missing. It's not on the list. It's not on the list. Go ahead. It's got to be in there. That's not 
Okay, so we got there and actually got a little bit of time left, which is good. It means I can show you some just little supplemental things to finish off, although that was really where I wanted to get to. Um, there's another, uh, again, you know, it sounds like you need a bit of a helping hand on learning what films are good to see. Uh, there's another good film called Dark Star, uh, directed by um, John Carpenter. You know John Carpenter? Yeah. Uh, so this is like his student movie that he made when he was graduating. It's really good. It's a kind of uh, lo-fi, cheap, kind of almost parody of 2001, kind of hippies in space. And it finishes with a great philosophical conversation between the astronaut and an intelligent bomb. Uh, it's really very good. Uh, it was written by Dan O'Bannon, who also worked on the scripts for Alien and Total Recall. In fact, uh, the reason we've got Alien is because of Dark Star. Uh, Dark Star was not a financial success because the world is not fair. Right? Um, and after doing Dark Star, which is an attempt to do a comedy set in space and it didn't work commercially, Dan O'Bannon said, Right, I'm trying to make people laugh in space and it didn't work. Now I'm going to make them scream. And he wrote Alien. Uh, so there you go. That's, that's Dark Star. Some words of caution. I've said a lot of kind of you know high speculation about how good AI might become. Bear in mind that people have said this before, and they have been wrong. Uh, there's an interesting guy called Steven Pinker uh, who says that human level AI is 15 to 25 years away and always has been. And he's sort of right. Uh, this is a funny paper that charts the history of predictions, including expert predictions. And to be honest, people who imagine themselves experts have always been saying exactly that, that human level AI was like 20 years away. They've been saying it since 1950. <laughs> so, uh, you know, maybe we're wrong again. Maybe neural nets will just be really good at doing certain things and that'll be cool, uh, but it won't be the, the full deal. They'll be good at, you know, language translation, image recognition, certain types of problems, speech recognition. Maybe they, they won't be taking over the world. Um, there's a guy called Rodney Brooks who's done a lot of work in this field. He thinks we shouldn't worry about the machine uprising. Uh, and the results of the Loebner Prize suggest we don't have much to worry about. The 2015 uh, thing happened a few months ago, but the transcripts weren't available on their site when I looked. I thought I would show you uh, the results from 2014, just to ease your fears that were about to be taken over. Uh, the winner was Rose. Uh, let's see how intelligent she was. I should point out, I think the best chatbot we've seen so far is those two bots talking to each other. Yeah, it was pretty good. But remember, it was just mining a huge stream of like you know text data from real people. So basically, it was just paraphrasing stuff that other real humans had said to each other, but it just stitched them together and decided which things related to which other things, so it felt like a conversation. But obviously, some of that silly stuff they were doing is clearly just cut and pasted from whatever source data it was trained on. Um, so here's Rose. Dum -da -dum. Uh, what's Rose got to say for herself? So these are some specimen questions that they use. Hope you can read it. Uh, so this is the question. My name's Adam. What's your name? Nice to meet you. I'm Rose. Blah, blah, blah. My hobbies are battling robots and playing ARGs. I love watching Doctor Who. Well, that's a good sign. Uh, most intelligent people do. Um, which is bigger, a cat or a kitten? The kitten is bigger. Hmm. All right. This is one of their problems. They've got no world knowledge. They don't know anything. Um, blah, 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 blah. Um... I mean, it's not terrible, but you know, uh, it's not hugely impressive. Yeah, so that was that one. And there's some others. There's one who's an alien. I'll skip him, I think, though. And we'll go to Trollbot, which is one that uh, attempts to be deliberately obnoxious in the manner of everyone online. So I think Trollbot is writing most of the comments on YouTube, as far as I can tell. Let's see what he has to say for himself. Hello, my name's Adam, what's your name? I do not welcome your presence, be gone from my sight. Uh, I don't care about you. Uh, yeah, Nothing, because that's what you are. It's all in caps as well, which I like. Um, oh wait, don't tell me, I don't care. <laughs> which one do you think, moron? Um, why don't you just kill yourself? Yeah, it is, it's YouTube, isn't it? So. <laughs> Uh, this is obviously how that is done. This must be Google's secret plan to make it look as if people actually uh, use use YouTube. Um, ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, trollbot. Yeah. 
How many siblings do I have? I'm not your little pet calculator, you scummy worm. Figure it out on your own. <laughs> All right. Uh, what else have I got? Um, oh, yeah, you can watch this in your own time if you like when I put the slides out. This is actually a quite a good uh, little five-minute film about the speech recognition task. It includes some uh, comments from this Jeffrey Hinton guy who I'm a fan of, explaining how it, how it work, works. Um, so that you might find interesting. But the, the lecture is finished, so now I'll just wait for you to turn up and we'll do your project review things uh, at the appropriate time.